On Democracy by Robert A. Dahl Voiced by the Catalyst Games Chapter 3 What Lies Ahead When we discuss democracy, perhaps nothing gives rise to more confusion than the simple fact that democracy refers to both an ideal and an actuality. We often fail to make the distinction clear. For example, Alan says, I think democracy is the best possible form of government. Beth says, You must be crazy to believe that so-called democratic governments in this country is the best we can have. Why, I don't even think it's much of a democracy. Alan is of course speaking of democracy as an ideal, whereas Beth is referring to it an actual government, usually called a democracy. Until Alan and Beth make clear which meaning each has in mind, they may flounder about, talking right past each other from extensive experience. I know how easily this can happen. Even I regret to add, among scholars who are deeply knowledgeable about democratic ideas and practices. We can usually avoid this kind of confusion just by making clear which meaning we intend. Alan continues. Oh, I didn't mean our actual government. As to that, I'd be inclined to agree with you. Beth. Well, you're talking about ideal governments, then I think you're dead right. I do believe that as an idea, democracy is the best form of government. That is why I'd like our own government to be a lot more democratic than it really is. Philosophers have engaged in endless debates about the differences between our judgments about goals, ends, values, and so on, and our judgments about reality, actuality, and so on. We make judgments of the first kind in response to questions like, what ought I to do? What is the right thing for me to do? We make judgments for the second kind in response to such questions as What can I do? What options are open to me? What are the likely consequences of my choosing to do X rather than Y? A convenient label for the first is value judgments or moral judgments. For the second, empirical judgments. Words about words. Although philosophers have engaged in endless debates about the nature of value judgments and empirical judgments and differences between one kind of judgment and the other, we need not concern ourselves here with these philosophical issues. For in everyday life we are fairly accustomed to distinguishing between the real things and the ideal things. However, we need to bear in mind that the distinction between value judgments and empirical judgments is useful, provided that we don't push it too far. If we assert, a government ought to give equal consideration to the good and interests of every person bound by its decisions, or happiness is the highest good. We are close to making pure value judgments as we can get. An example at the opposite extreme, a strictly empirical proposition, is Newton's famous law of universal gravitation, asserting that the force between any two bodies is directly proportional to the product of their masses, and inversely proportional to the square of the distinct distance between them. In practice, many assertions contain or imply elements of both kinds of judgments. This is merely always the case with judgments about public policy. For example, someone who says the government should establish a program of universal health insurance is asserting in effect that 1. Health is a good end. 2. The government should strive to achieve that end and 3. Universal health insurance is the best means of attaining that end. Moreover, we make an enormous number of empirical judgments like free. That represents the best judgment we can make in the face of great uncertainties. These are not scientific conclusions in a strict sense. They are often based on a mixture of hard evidence, soft evidence, 
no evidence and certainty. Judgments like these are sometimes called practical and prudential. Finally, one important kind of practical judgment is to balance gains to one's value, person or group against cost to another, value, person or group. To describe situations this kind, I'll sometimes borrow an expression often used by economists and say that we have to choose among various possible trade-offs among our ends. As we move along, we'll encounter all these variants of value judgments and empirical judgments, democratic goals and actualities. Although it is helpful to distinguish between ideals and actualities, we also need to understand how democratic ideals or goals and democratic actualities are connected. I'm going to spell out these connections for fully, more fully in later chapters. Meanwhile, let me use the chart as a rough guide to what lies ahead. Each of the four items under ideal and actual is a fundamental question. What is democracy? What does democracy mean? Put another way, what standards should we use to determine whether, and to what extent, a government is democratic? Now, what is democracy and why democracy fall under ideals? And they are covered in chapter 4 and 5 to 7. Actual covers actual democratic governments, which are what political institutions does democracy require, and what conditions favour democracy, which will be covered in part 3 and part 4. I believe that such a system have to meet five criteria, and then a system meeting these criteria would be fully democratic. In chapter 4, I describe four of these criteria, and in chapter 6, I show why we need a fifth. Remember, however, that the criteria described an idea our, or perfect democratic system. None of us, I imagine, believes that we could actually attain a perfect democratic system given the many limits imposed on us in the real world. The criteria do provide us, though, with standards against which we can compare the achievements and remain in the imperfections of actual political systems and their institutions, and they can guide us towards solutions that would bring us closer to the ideal. Why democracy? What reasons can we give for believing that democracy is the best political system and what values are best served by democracy? In answering these questions, it is essential to keep in mind that we are not just asking why people now support democracy or why we have supported it in the past or how democratic systems have come about. People may favour democracy for many reasons. Some, for example, may favour democracy without thinking much about what they do. In their time and place, giving lip service to democracy may just be the conventional or traditional thing to do. Some might endorse democracy because they believe that with a democratic government they will stand a better chance of getting rich, or because they think democratic politi politics would open up a promising political career for them, or because someone they admire tells them to, and so on. Are these reasons for supporting democracy of more general and perhaps even universal relevance? I believe there are. These will be discussed in chapter 5 through 7. In order to meet the ideal standards the best we can, given the limits and possibilities in the real world, what political institutions are necessary? As we shall see in the new chapters, next chapter, in varying times and places, Political systems with significantly different political institutions have been called democracies or republics. In the last chapter we encounter one reason why democratic institutions differ. And they have been adapted to huge differences in size or scale of political units, in population, territory or both. Some political units such as the English village are tiny in area and population. Others, like China, Brazil or the United States, are gigantic in both. A small city or town might meet democratic criteria reasonably well without some of the institutions that would require in, say, a large country, 
Since the 18th century, however, the idea of democracy has been applied to entire countries. The United States, France, Great Britain, Norway, Japan, India, political institutions that seem necessary or desirable for democracy on the small scale of a town or city prove to be wholly inadequate on a far larger scale of modern country. The political institutions suitable for a town will be wholly inadequate even for countries that would be small on a global scale, such as Denmark or Netherlands. As a result, in the 19th and 20th centuries, a new set of institutions developed, in part resembled political institutions in earlier democracies and republics, but viewed in their entirety constitute a wholly new political system. Chapter 2 provided a brief sketch of this historical development. In part 3 I described more fully the political institutions of actual democracies and how they vary in important ways. Word of caution. To say that certain institutions are necessary is not to say that they are enough to achieve perfect democracy. In every democratic country, a substantial gap exists between actual and ideal go democracy. That gap offers us a challenge. Can we find ways to make democratic countries more democratic? If even democratic countries are not fully democratic, what can we say about countries that lack some or all of the major political institutions of modern democracy? The non-democratic countries, how, if at all, can they be made more democratic? Indeed, just why is it that some countries have become relatively more democratic than others? These questions lead us still to others. What conditions in a country or any other political union favour the development and stability of democratic institutions? And conversely, what conditions are likely to prevent or impede their development and stability? In today's world, these questions are of extraordinary importance. Fortunately, at the end of the 20th century, we have much better answers than could be obtained only a few generations ago. Far better answers than at el any earlier time in recorded history. And in part 4, I indicate what we know about answers to these crucial questions as the 20th century draws to a close. To be sure, the answers we have are by no means free from uncertainty, yet they do provide a firmer starting point for seeking solutions that we have ever had before. From value judgments to empirical judgments. Before leaving the chart, I want to call attention to an important shift as we move from left to right. In answering what is democracy, we make judgments that depend almost exclusively on our values, or what we believe is good, right, or desirable goal. When we move on the question why democracy, our judgments still strongly depend on ideal values, but they also depend on our beliefs about casual connections, limits and possibilities in the actual world around us, that is, on empirical judgments. Here we begin to rely more heavily on interpretations of evidence, facts and purported facts. When we try to decide what political institutions democracy actually requires, we rely even more on evidence and empirical judgments. Yet here too, what matters to us depends in part on our previous judgments about the meaning and value of democracy. Indeed, the reason we may be concerned with the shape of political institutions in the actual world is that the values of democracy and its criteria are important to us. When we reach the right side of the chart, and undertake to determine what conditions favour the development and stability of democratic institutions, our judgments are straightforward, empirical. They depend entirely on how we interpret the evidence available to us. For example, do or do not democratic beliefs contribute significantly to survival of democratic political institutions? Yet here again, the reason these empirical judgments are important and relevant to us is that we care about democracy and its values. Our path then will take us from the exploration of ideals, goals and values in part 2 
to the much more empirical descriptions of democratic political institutions in part three. We'll then be in position to move on in part four to description of the conditions that are favourable or unfavourable for democratic political institutions, where our judgments will be almost exclusively empirical in nature. Finally, in the last chapter I'll describe some of the challenges that democracy face in the years ahead.